Hi guys, welcome to another AP Bio Notes video. Um, we are starting on Unit 2, which is our cells unit, which is very exciting. Um, cells is one of my favorite topics, so I hope you, that you really enjoy it. Um, but we're going to be talking today about the different organelles, which a lot of us, I'm sure, will be review for you guys. Um, maybe you forgot it, but it will still count as review, even if you forgot it. Um, but we'll be going through the different organelles of the cell and also different types. Um, also in this unit, we're going to cover diffusion and osmosis um, and kind of go from there. But we'll start with organelles today. So. This is in your OneNote. If you want to use it, you're welcome to use it. You are not at all required to use it, but just know that it's there for you. Also, I linked the um, actual Google Slides to the top. If you prefer to use the slides version, you're welcome to that as well. Okay. So first of all, I kind of wanted to start by showing you some like generic cell diagrams. There's this one and there's this one. Um, and both of them are really like probably the cell diagrams that you've been seeing since you were in seventh grade. Um, just like the very generic plant and animal cell diagrams. And what I really want to make sure I say about that is that these diagrams are generic for a reason. They are not accurate to what every single cell looks like. So. As you're looking at these diagrams that look like your basic cell, um, just be aware, especially if you plan to continue with biology, that they are not what most cells look like. They're they're generic and they're um, they're not the specialized cells that actually exist in your body and in the body's. I guess bodies <laughs> um, in plants as well. So we'll just kind of talk about that. But these are the organelles that we're going to be talking about today. Hopefully they look a little bit familiar at least, but if not, know that it's going to be okay. Um, I'm going to talk to you about them. So there you go. Um, and here's again the animal version of that, which I'm sure looks familiar to you. Um, maybe not with these projections coming off, but. Um, generic nonetheless. Okay, so starting to talk about cells. Cells um, haven't been like discovered for really that long. Um, it wasn't until like the microscope um, was invented that people could even see cells at all. So the first man who like discovered cells was actually a monk and he like drew these cells and called them cells because they literally looked like the cells that the monks lived in. Like they were um, from a plant, so like rectangular cells. Um, and then when electron microscopes were discovered, that's when they were actually able to see that there were organelles inside the cells, which if you have never put this together, organelle means tiny organ. And that's what that's what they are. They're just the tiny like functional units of cells, just like the organs are functional units of us. So this just kind of gives you a description on size that um, you can only see about 0.1 millimeters and even that like <laughs> best of luck to you seeing things that small. Um, prokaryotic cells are from one to 10 micrometers. Um, and the smallest are in the nanometer, so really, 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 really small. Eukaryotic cells are about 10 to 100 micrometers. So I'm just going to make like a small note here that eukaryotic cells are much larger. That looks horrific, but you know what it says. Um, then prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are going to be very small and simple. And then within eukaryotic cells, you, of course, have organelles, um, which most of them are about the size of bacteria, but some are even smaller than bacteria. And I'll talk to you in a minute about why they're actually the size of bacteria. So 
just know that like cells haven't been known about and like their functions and all of that for a super long time. It's a pretty recent development. Okay. So this is going to be a bit of review from freshman bio, good times. Um, there's two main cell types. They're prokaryotic and eukaryotic. So here they are. Pro oops. Use a highlighter. Prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Um, the prokaryotic cells have no nucleus and they have no membrane bound organelles. So this is important because most organelles are membrane bound, which means that they have like a layer of membrane, just like the cell membrane that goes around them, but a few don't. So the ones that don't, I'm just going to make a note down here that they have ribosomes. Ribosomes are not membrane bound. They have cytoplasm, which is kind of like the jelly filling of the cell, which I don't really count as an organelle, but it's worth mentioning that they have it. Um, and then they also have some sort of genetic material, which in most cases is DNA. And then going into the genetic material, um, where the genetic material is stored is called the nucleoid, but it's not the same as a nucleus. It's basically just like all the DNA clumped together in the middle of the cell. Um, there's no like storage compartment really for it. It's just kind of like where it ends up hanging out. The other thing about prokaryotic cells, which we'll talk more about later on, is that they also have plasmids. which are small circular genes. Uh, usually it's like one to three genes on a plasmid, but we'll talk about them more uh, later on this year when we get a little bit further along. But the main source of genetic material for a bacteria is a chromosome, which is actually circular, but it like, boils up to be a larger nucleoid region. The only prokaryotes are bacteria. Everything else is a eukaryote. So if we're looking over here, eukaryotes are plants, animals, fungi, and protists. So most things are eukaryotic. Um, eukaryotes have a nucleus. That's the main, let's see, I keep messing up with my highlighter. Um, they have a nucleus. That's the main way to differentiate between a prokaryote and a eukaryote besides the size. The eukaryote will be a lot bigger. Um, and then they have organelles that will actually like function as organs very specifically to make sure that the cell um, actually works and is able to survive. One thing that I think is worth mentioning is that most eukaryotes are multicellular, so they have specialized cells. For example, like you have specialized cells that are neurons and you have specialized cells that are red blood cells. Those cells are gonna function really differently and they're gonna have different organelles and different amounts of those organelles because they have really different jobs. So it's just it's just gonna depend a lot on the cell type. Today what I'm teaching you about is just like the organelles that they could have, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every cell has every single organelle. Um, for example, red blood cells actually don't have a nucleus because they have to be really, really small and able to fit through tiny little capillaries like the ones that are in your eyes. So just one example. Um, but they actually still are considered eukaryotic. Red blood cells are still eukaryotic even though they have no nucleus. Okay, here is a um, diagram of a prokaryotic cell. So you can see here the chromosome. Uh, the chromosome would be called the nucleoid. Um, and then you can see also that the prokaryotic cell has ribosomes. It has a cell membrane or a plasma membrane. It has a cell wall, which is... Um, something that plant cells also have, but the cell wall of bacteria is 
actually made of a different substance than the cell wall of a plant. Cell wall of a plant is made of cellulose, which is like plant fiber. And for a bacteria, it's also actually made of something called peptidoglycan, which helps you determine whether the bacteria is gram positive or gram negative, which if you're a doctor, helps you figure out how you should treat that actual bacteria. We'll talk about it more later this year. Um, bacteria also have a capsule, some of them, which is like a sticky slime layer on the outside that allows them to um, attach to a host. And then some bacteria also have a flagella, which is a tail that helps them to move. So this is a prokaryotic organism. Um, one thing that I do want to just make sure I say, like I said about the plant and animal cells, this is a generic prokaryotic cell. So again, not everything is going to look like this. Some bacteria are round. Some bacteria are sort of like a spiral shape. Um, some of them are none of the above. So it just depends on what the organism is that you're actually looking at. This is a helpful guide for sort of the basics, but it's not... Um, like an end all to every single cell. So there you go. All right, here is your generic eukaryotic cell. So you can see that it's already like a lot more complex. I'll put that over here. Complex, this is eukaryotic. Um, and just as like kind of a helpful hint, eu in Greek, eu means true. And karyo is um, kind of like a Greek root for nucleus. So prokaryotic is before nucleus. Eukaryotic is true nucleus. So that's what you can see, obviously, in this picture, is that there is a true nucleus. Um, and then all the regular organelles that you're used to seeing are here um, in, in this image. And again, this is not like every single cell looks this way. This is just everything that you possibly could cram into a eukaryotic cell is in this picture. So most of your cells, probably none of your cells, um, look like this. Not, your cells don't look like this. So just keep that in mind. All right. So we're going to start with kind of like the king of the organelles, I guess, the nucleus. Um, sort of the brain of brain of the operation. Um, the nucleus is the storage center for the DNA. So it contains genes responsible for the cell to function. And we call that chromatin. Just as sort of like a helpful reminder, chromatin is DNA coiled around proteins called histones. Um, and then eventually what happens is chromatin can coil up into chromosomes. And the only times it actually does that is when it's time for the cell divide, to divide and do mitosis. But chromatin is your genetic material, which includes DNA plus proteins. Um, and you can think of the protein sort of like a spool where the DNA is the thread like coils around it so that it's just a little nicer for storage. Inside of the nucleus is a structure called the nucleolus, which um, is responsible for producing our RNA and ribosomes. The nucleolus, when you like look at a picture of the nucleus, so if I'm gonna like draw a nucleus down here, this green line is the nuclear envelope, which is a membrane. Oops, I was going to write membrane. It's envelope. And then inside the nucleus is usually like a dark dot, which is the nucleolus. And this is responsible for producing um, our RNA, which helps to make up ribosomes, and then the actual like ribosomes themselves. Um, the nuclear envelope, which I just drew, actually has holes in it. They're called nuclear pores, and they allow things to pass in and out of the nucleus. This is important because um, you might remember from like freshman bio transcription and translation, your DNA is producing mRNA, 
which has to actually leave the nucleus to be um, translated into a protein that works for you. So the nuclear envelope has these holes um, called pores that allow that to happen. And then the ribosomes that are produced by the nucleolus can either end up being free ribosomes, which means they will not be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes, or they could be bound ribosomes, which means um, that they will be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Bound ribosomes are going to be producing proteins that need to be packaged and actually like shipped out of the cell, whereas free ribosomes are going to be producing proteins that actually work for the cell. So I'll just make a little note of that, that free ribosomes are going to be producing um, proteins for the cell. And bound ribosomes are going to be producing proteins to be exported. Um, and I'll just like draw this on here. We're about to get to endoplasmic reticulum, but on the nucleus surrounding it is sort of like folds of membrane. That's called the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER. And there will be some ribosomes that just attach their, these little dots to the actual endoplasmic reticulum. These are the bound ribosomes. Just say bound ribosome. But then you also can have ribosomes just floating around in the cell. Their job is to produce proteins. So let's see, ribosomes produce proteins. And sort of like the blueprint that they're using to produce the proteins is the DNA. Um, and then one other thing just about this is that the nuclear envelope has something called a nuclear lamina around it, um, and that is to help maintain the nucleus's round shape. It's just sort of like a network of proteins. And that's the nucleus and ribosomes. So here is sort of um, some images for that if you're more of a visual learner. You have the nucleus with those nuclear pores in it, which are these like sort of purpley um, sections right on the outside of the nuclear envelope. And then you have right in the, up next to the nucleus, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And these brown dots are the ribosomes that are attached. And within the nucleus, you have chromatin, which here's the, the purple section is the proteins and the blue thread is the DNA. You can see it's just like coiled up really tightly to help it stay organized. And then in the very center of the nucleus, this dark section is the nucleolus, which will be producing more ribosomes and more rRNA. And then you can also see sort of a... Um, Microscope image of the nuclear lamina, which just looks almost like a mesh that's keeping the nucleus in this um, round shape so that it doesn't like disintegrate. One thing that's kind of interesting is the nuclear lamina actually breaks down during mitosis because the nucleus has to break down. And the um, chromosomes then are released to actually be like pulled apart and make two separate cells. We'll talk about that later on. And that's the nucleus. All right, so makes sense from there to go into the um, endoplasmic reticulum, which from now on I'm going to call ER because it's a whole lot easier. Um, these are just membrane folds that, if you want to get really scientific, are called cisternae. Um, the fold, the folds are called cisternae. Um, this is about half of the membrane that exists in the cell. So you have to think like there's a membrane that exists outside the cell, but also every organelle also has a membrane around it. And this organelle, endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi bodies are literally just membrane. So just folds of membrane back and forth create this entire organelle. There are two types of ER, smooth and rough. We already kind of talked about the rough, so I'll do that one first. That's the bound ribosomes. So 
Just remember too that the bound ribosomes are going to be producing proteins that leave the cell. Um, and what the rough ER does is as the ribosomes, which in this little picture, this was supposed to be a GIF, but it like isn't playing because it's one note. Um, these orange things are ribosomes. They're like little factories that are pumping out proteins. So the proteins thread through the cisternae, which are those folds, and eventually are um, packaged into transport vesicles. Vesicles are just um, like transport bubbles, I'm going to call them. They're like pockets of membrane that contain something that needs to be moved around. In this case, it's proteins. And the rough ER also contributes to making new membrane um, to restore itself and to also restore the rest of the cell. The smooth ER has no ribosomes on it, and that's why it's called smooth, because if you look at it under a microscope, it will look smooth. It has a few jobs. One of them is to produce or synthesize lipids. Another one is that it breaks down glucose. And it's also really important for detoxifying um, your cells from drugs and poisons, including alcohol. So your cells in your liver have a larger amount of smooth ER than uh, most of the other cells in your body because it's really important for detoxification. And your liver does that. So that's the ER. Here's some pictures of it. You can see over here the smooth ER has no ribosomes attached to it, and that's why it would be considered smooth. Um, you can also see it on the microscope image that the smooth ER is sort of like out here where there's no um, ribosomes or like bumps attached. And then you have this um, rough ER closer to the nucleus, which makes sense because remember the nucleolus is producing ribosomes. So as it releases the ribosomes, they're going to land usually closer to the nucleus, and that's where your rough ER is going to be. Here's an example of a transport vesicle. This is why I called it a bubble because it, it often looks like that in pictures. And inside of that would be proteins that are being moved probably to the Golgi body um, to be shipped out of the cell. So that's the ER. All right. Also part of this endomembrane system is the Golgi. Sometimes you see it called Golgi apparatus or Golgi body. It's usually what I go with. Um, but it's also made of cisternae, which are just like membrane sacs. And it's sort of like the Amazon warehouse of the cell where it like receives proteins from the ER or lipids if it was smooth ER. And its job is to like kind of sort those things and package them and ship them out of the cell. It's also responsible for producing some polysaccharides. So remember, polysaccharides are carbs, complex carbs. Um, and lysosomes are an organelle we haven't talked about yet, but their job is um, sort of like trash disposal. And the Golgi is responsible for producing them or synthesizing. Those are interchangeable words. Um, and then in the Golgi, there's something called polarity, which basically just means that everything in the Golgi moves in the same direction. So it starts by coming in at the cis phase, which will be closer to the ER, and passes through the trans phase as it's leaving. And that will make more sense when I show you this picture. So here's the cis face where products will be received from the ER. The folds are the cisternae. And then the trans face is where things will be released. So I'll just say like enter and exit. So just, I mean, really think about it like the Amazon situation where like things come in from wherever they came from and they're in the warehouse and then to leave the warehouse, they have to like go out a different door um, once they're like in their box. The box would be like the vesicle 
which this is a vesicle right here. And then it will be shipped um, probably out of the cell if it came from the ER. All right, lysosomes. So again, this image was supposed to be a GIF. If you click on the actual Google slides, you can see it, but it has the lysosome like <laughs> rolling over this like tiny whistling thing and like digesting it, which for me is like pretty entertaining. Um, so I recommend watching it. <laughs> but lysosomes are responsible for storing hydrolytic enzymes. Hydrolytic means that they do hydrolysis. This is a good time to quiz yourself and be like, hmm, what is hydrolysis? Hydrolysis is breaking apart polymers. So break down. Basically, these enzymes that are inside lysosomes are responsible for digesting um, waste products or damaged organelles. They work best in an acidic environment. So usually the environment inside of a lysosome is acidic. It's high in hydrogen ions. Um, and then some interesting things about lysosomes is that they are often responsible for some genetic disorders. So one of them is Tay-Sachs, which is this disorder down here. Um, it's a disorder where lysosomes can't digest lipids and it actually causes like buildup in the brain, which causes children with Tay-Sachs to die at a super young age. It's actually really sad. Um, Tay-Sachs is more common in the Jewish population, which is another interesting thing. And if you've ever seen, there's a, actually a Grey's Anatomy episode where there's a Tay-Sachs child if you're a Grey's Anatomy fan, but it's a pretty um, sad disorder. Also, another uh, thing about this, one of my best friends works for the MPS Society, which is a genetic disorder that is just like many different genes can be affected in uh, many different severities, but it's a lysosomal storage disease, which I recommend looking up if you're interested in genetic diseases and that sort of stuff. But it's a real thing that affects people and it has really actually very drastic effects. Um, which might not necessarily be what you would expect. They're sort of like the trash can of the cells. You'd be like, well, it's fine if you don't have them, but it actually can have a big effect. That's lysosomes. All right, vacuoles are storage organelles. There are many different types. Um, there's food vacuoles, which obviously are gonna store uh, nutrients. There's contractile vacuoles, who are going to pump water out of the cell. These are going to be common in freshwater protists. Which are going to be things like amoebas. So these freshwater organisms, if they absorb too much water, they actually can burst and die. Um, so it's really important for them to be able to pump out water using a contractile vacuole. And then in plants, there's a central vacuole that's really important. It's super large compared to the rest of the cell. Um, and it's really important for storing water because, of course, like if you're thirsty, you can go get a drink of water, but plants can't. So they have to have water storage. Um, and they also allow for a larger surface area to volume ratio, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end of this week, but super important for cells. Those are vacuoles, storage containers. Okay, so this is just kind of showing, um, first of all, how different things are digested or absorbed by the cell. So sort of related to lysosomes, you have here, um, the cell is actually eating, that's what phagocytosis is eating. So in this situation, this like brown blobby thing is food. The cell engulfs the food and stores it in a food vacuole, which actually is just like pinched off cell membrane, but it becomes a vacuole once it like pinches off. The lysosome fuses with the food vacuole and 
allows those enzymes, which are the blue dots, to digest the food um, into usable parts for the cell. So that's sort of a lysosome um, at work. You also can have a situation where the cell starts to digest organelles that are damaged or no longer functioning. So in this situation, you have a perioxisome, which is responsible for like some detoxy stuff, and a mitochondria. These organelles probably are like old or malfunctioning, and they've been wrapped up in a vesicle. The lysosome will fuse with them and use those hydrolytic enzymes to digest the parts and make them reusable to like rebuild the organelles. You can see up here the electron images, electron microscope images of both of those situations. Um, but I think maybe the like diagrams are a little more helpful. So autophagy is like the cell digesting itself. I'll say digesting old parts. Both of these situations are important for lysosomes as well as vacuoles. Okay. Here's a diagram that just shows the central vacuole and how big it really is in a plant cell. This is only going to be in plants. So if you see a diagram that is a cell that has a super, super large central vacuole, it should tell you right away that it is a plant cell. That's my like helpful hint on that. Okay, ribosomes I already talked about um, a decent amount, but they're made of our RNA, so actually nucleic acids and protein subunits that kind of connect together. There's a small subunit and a big subunit, which actually is shown in this like cartoon. This is actually how they are. They sort of like clamp around um, an mRNA, which is the code for the protein. And then we already talked about how they can either be free floating or attached to the ER. And I'll just say it again, but attached to the ER means that they're going to be exported proteins. And free floating means that the proteins are used by the cell. Um, so just to be super clear, ribosomes produce the proteins. The proteins are coded for by the DNA of your cells. So we'll talk about that later on too. Um, here's just some diagrams that show uh, ribosomes. You can see them in the microscope image just sort of floating around. Um, and then also the large and the small subunit which are made of the rRNA as well as protein together. And then the mRNA just sort of threads through this middle section um, in order to produce a protein. So this would be mRNA, which is protein blueprint. And the mRNA would have been produced by the DNA. All right, mitochondria, everyone's favorite. So the mitochondria, you all probably know, is the powerhouse of the cell, which we have to talk about what that like actually means because anyone could tell you that. But what it means is that it's responsible for producing ATP, which is energy. And it produces that during cellular respiration, which we'll talk a whole bunch about later on this year. Um, Basically, right now, you just need to know that it's the energy producer of the cell. Mitochondria consists of two membranes. So it has an inner membrane and outer membrane. I'm just making sure there's a picture down here. Yeah. Um, so on the outer membrane, it's smooth, but the inner membrane is folded up into these um, folds called cristae. So this is a little confusing because the folds of the mitochondria are called cristae. The folds of the Golgi and the ER are called cisternae. So they sound really similar, and I'm really sorry about that, but they just do. And then in between the two membranes is called the intermembrane space. The very inside is called the matrix. So actually, I wasn't going to draw this, but I think I'm going to. So you have sort of this like peanut shape. This is the outer membrane. And then you have an inner membrane that is folded up 
with sort of wiggly lines. Um, those folds would be the cristae. And then this is the intermembrane space. And this is the matrix. So two membranes and then a matrix in the very middle. Um, mitochondria have enzymes that are needed to produce ATP from the glucose that you eat, as well as the oxygen that you breathe, which we'll talk about in detail later on this year. And then the folds in the inner membrane are important because they actually increase the surface area with which you can produce energy. Um, again, some cells are gonna have a lot more mitochondria than others, and that's because they need to produce a lot more energy. So for example, like your muscles are gonna have a lot more mitochondria than some other cells of your body would. All right, let's look at the pictures. So here they are. This is sort of the image that I just drew, but a little more 3D. We have this outer membrane, and an inner membrane that's folded up into the cristae. And on the inside, you have um, the matrix. And what's interesting is that you actually have inside the matrix ribosomes, which suggests that the mitochondria was actually like previously a bacterial organism. I'm gonna just put this down here. Um, that there's a theory called which we'll talk about also when we get to evolution. But basically it's the theory that um, mitochondria were once bacteria, which means that they were prokaryotic. So they were tiny organisms that had free-floating DNA and ribosomes, exactly like a bacteria does today, um, and were engulfed by larger cells. And then um, instead of being digested, they actually continue to live inside the larger cell and like, kind of serve the larger cell as energy producers but also gained the protection of the larger cells. They were less likely to like die because they lived inside the larger cell. Um, what's kind of interesting about this as well is that mitochondria have their own DNA, which you can see in this diagram, um, which is called mDNA. And you can trace your mitochondrial DNA back through your maternal side because when the sperm and the egg fuse to form an embryo, all the mitochondria come from the egg cell, which means that all the mitochondria you have now um, are descendants of your mother's mitochondria. And those are descendants of her, mitochondria, her mother's mitochondria. So scientists have actually traced mitochondrial DNA all the way back to this um, woman that they call mitochondrial Eve, the first woman, um, which is just like a pretty fascinating thing to think about that all your other DNA is a mixture of all your ancestors, um, but not your, not your mitochondrial DNA, which is cool. All right, we're getting close to the end. So chloroplasts, of course, hopefully you know, are only in plants. Their job is to produce um, Glucose using photosynthesis. So that's their, their main function is to use the light energy and to produce chemical energy, which the chemical energy is glucose, sugar. Um, they also contain chlorophyll, which is a green plant pigment, which is why plants are green when you see them is because of the chlorophyll. Um, in the fall, the chlorophyll actually breaks down because it gets cold, and that's why leaves turn yellow or red or whatever they turn. Um, they also have a double outer membrane. So it's sort of the same concept of mitochondria that they probably were photosynthetic prokaryotes that were engulfed um, and continue to live symbiotically inside of the larger cell. 
Inside of them, they have these discs called thylakoids, which are stacked up. They kind of look like green quarters stacked up on top of each other, and they are responsible for doing a lot of the photosynthesis, which we'll talk about in a future unit. Um, and the chlorophyll is actually like inside of those thylakoids. Chloroplasts are only going to be in the leaf cells of the plants, They're only going to be in the the cells that actually do photosynthesis. So roots and stems are not going to be high in chloroplasts. And then just like the mitochondria has the matrix, the chloroplast has stroma, which is fluid that just kind of surrounds the thylakoid. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the process of photosynthesis. Here's a nice little chloroplast um, photo. So you can see those thylakoids stacked up in discs. Here they are. Um, a stack of thylakoids is called a granum. Many stacks of thylakoids are called grana. Um, and just like in the mitochondria, you can see that it has ribosomes, it has DNA. So they originally probably were their own organisms that have just continued to sort of reproduce um, throughout time asexually. All right, this is it. So the last thing is that after all these organelles, you have to have something to keep them actually inside the cell. And there's two possible options for that. Um, one is a cell wall and one is a cell membrane. Every single cell, all cells, has a cell membrane. And cell membranes are made of phospholipids. Um, which I'll talk a lot more about in my next video. But every single cell has one. It's responsible for allowing things to enter and exit the cell. We'll put that down here. Allow entering and exit of materials. Um, and then the cell wall is only in some organisms. It's in bacteria, it's in protists, and it's in fungi, as well as plants. Um, and it's more responsible for structure and support. So the cell membrane is gonna be responsible for sort of like balancing homeostasis um, and like allowing it to communicate with other cells. The cell wall is there for structure and support. So this diagram here is actually talking about the cell membrane, not cell walls. Um, and then just a reminder too, I talked about this a little bit earlier on, but uh, different cell walls are made of different things. So in plants, it's cellulose. In fungi, it's chitin. In bacteria, it's peptidoglycan. And in plants, cell walls actually have holes called plasmodesmata that allow cytoplasm to move between because the cells have to communicate with each other. So what that looks like is if I have two plant cells that are right next to each other and they each have a cell wall. This is a very rudimentary drawing. Um, then the plasmodesmata will be a hole. Oops, I didn't want to erase like everything. So the plasmodesmata are just little channels in between the cells that allow um, nutrients and signals to transfer in between. So these gaps would be plasmodesmata. And they're only in plants. Okay, guys, that was a ton of info. Thank you so much for listening. You did such a great job. I know you did. Um, we're going to do cell membrane stuff later on this week, but you're killing it. Love you lots. Bye.